Hello there and welcome to Style America. We have a very special guest today is Montgomery J. Granger, retired the three-time mobilized U.S. Army Reserve Major and he is also the author of Saving Grace at Guantanamo Bay, a memoir of a citizen warrior and contributor of the blaze. Thank you so much for being with us, Montgomery. Welcome. It's certainly my pleasure, and like I said before, it's like talking to an old friend. So thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It is absolutely the same for me. So uh, first of all, uh, I would like um, you know to talk a bit about uh, your story. You have a very fascinating story as a veteran and educator and writer. So tell us a bit about these three aspects of your life. Mm. Well, I started writing, I blame my mother, when I was seven years old. For my birthday, she gave me a diary. So for many, many years, every single day I wrote something. And uh, I got hooked. Uh, my mother also began in me a, a very uh, robust appetite for books. And uh, she was a history buff. We have a, a relative who fought in the American Civil War. And uh, reading his diaries confirmed that being a soldier is 99% boredom and 1% sheer terror. Mm -hmm. And I became fascinated with um, war as a young man. Um, and ironically, because I ended up taking care of bad guys, uh, I was fascinated by uh, prisoner of war stories and it all began when my mother introduced me to a friend of hers who is a former German Wehrmacht officer uh, who joined World War II uh, very late in the war. Uh, he was a lieutenant and was in charge of a group of boys, old men, uh, deaf, uh, who had been put together in a unit to try to stop Patton's army. Yeah. Um, he was unsuccessful. In fact, they were abandoned, cut off from supplies, wow. and surrounded at one point by uh, a unit of Patton's army. And they surrendered. And he said he was afraid that they were going to harm them because he had heard stories of the SS uh, who had murdered American POWs. Yeah. So he was fearful. Yeah. But the story had a very happy ending. Uh, at the time I was speaking with him, uh, I was about maybe 16 years old, and I talk about this in my book, and uh, he said he still had the, the uh, wool uh, coat that was given to him as a POW. He said he was treated very well, wow. and this um, excited me. I was happy. I was proud uh, that Americans treated uh, prisoners of war so well. So I began on my own to study the phenomena uh, throughout the history of war, especially uh, the United States and how we treated prisoners of war. And it was just a hobby of mine uh, to read as much as I could about this. Yeah. Later in life, um, I really never wanted to join the military. I hadn't thought about it too much. Uh, I went to college and graduate school. And uh, I was sitting at home feeling sorry for myself one day because my loans were coming due. I had borrowed my financial future away to pay for college. So I saw a commercial on television. Be all you can be. <laughs> Loan repayment. And I thought to myself, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. Maybe I could join the Army, but what would I do? I didn't really want to shoot people and kill them. Uh, and I had gone to school to be a teacher. And I thought long and hard about it, and I said, well, what if I became a medic? Uh, you know, I could learn to help save lives instead of kill them. Yeah. And it would help me in my job as a physical education teacher, health teacher, and coach. And so that's what I did. Uh, in five years, my loans were paid off. And um, I was asked to become an officer. Mm -hmm. So I discussed it with my future wife. So again, was a dilemma. What job would I pick as an officer? Uh, they tried to put me into the infantry, but I resisted uh, and became a medical service officer. And basically, there are two jobs for every soldier. There's one in a fixed facility, in my case, a hospital, 
-hmm. I would be a hospital administrator. Mm -hmm. Or in the field, I would be an advisor to a commander. So I chose the latter. I would love to be an advisor to a commander. Right. So I became a medical platoon leader in an infantry battalion. And then I became a company commander of a field hospital. And then I performed various staff duties. And then came 1999. I was promotable to the rank of captain. But in the hospital unit I was in, there were no available positions for a captain. Okay, yeah. So I thought about getting out for a while, but someone contacted me and said they knew of a unit that was maybe 40 miles from my house, but still reachable that needed a captain, a medical service captain. So I said, okay, what kind of unit is it? And they said, well, it's an enemy prisoner of war military police unit. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I studied this as, as a young man. Amazing, yeah. So I became, I became very fascinated. So I went to interview for the position. I got the position. It was a small 12-person unit, a liaison detachment. Uh, created out of lessons learned from the first Gulf War, uh, where where the Americans went in and liberated, helped liberate Kuwait from uh, Iraqi forces, and the people in this unit, again ironically, there was only one large army prisoner, an enemy prisoner of war unit, mm -hmm. uh, it was a reserve unit, and the reason why it's a reserve unit is because if you're not at war, you don't need to hold any prisoners. All right, yeah. So many of the officers and enlisted and uh, non-commissioned officers had served in the first Gulf War in 92 and had the experience of uh, going into combat and having thousands of Iraqi soldiers simply surrender. Mm -hmm. And it created a, a dilemma because the war only lasted 10 days, mm -hmm. but the commander at the time, General Norman Schwarzkopf, decided to do what we call in football terminology an end around. He did a big sweeping movement around the bulk of the Iraqi forces. Yeah. So the support and combat service support units, like enemy prisoner of war units, had to go with them. It was very difficult to maintain logistical support. You might have one camp 500 miles from a command unit, and communication was very difficult. Mm -hmm. So what they decided to do is redesign the units to include these liaison detachments, more or less a command group. We had uh, military police officers. We had a JAG officer, which is military attorney. We had logistics officers, transportation officers, and me, a medical officer. So we would travel together, the 12 of us, uh, and theoretically follow the battle right. and, and provide command and control for the, for the uh, brigade commander. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had conferences, we had study sessions, I studied the Geneva Conventions, I studied the Law of Land Warfare, wow. I studied the military police manuals on enemy prisoner of war uh, operations, specifically the medical part. Sure. And then 9-11. Yeah. Uh, it changed my life forever. Mm -hmm. A lot has happened since then. But what happened immediately was we were called in. This uh, unit I was in is in New York, uh, about 20 miles from Ground Zero. Our mission in time of uh, emergency is to protect a local fort, Fort Totten, New York. Okay. But we still maintained a garrison at our unit headquarters in um, uh, Uniondale, New York. So I went back and forth to Uniondale for about a week until they said I was no longer needed and things calmed down a little bit. We understood more about what was going on, but that yeah. first day was very confusing. So we knew right away that we were going to go to Afghanistan and uh, fight the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so we began immediately plans for what we would do if we captured anyone. Uh, it was clear to us that we were fighting unlawful combatants. Yeah. And the mainstream media doesn't put this out at all. And that is that the Geneva Conventions were written to protect innocent civilians and property during wartime. They were not written to protect those who pretend to be civilians in order to murder them. Uh huh. So that's why the detainees that we captured on the battlefield and brought to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, 
right, yes. Had no rights. Mm -hmm. There was nothing for them in Geneva Conventions. There was nothing for them in the law of land warfare. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. And I guess I think the best example of uh, a, a legal process that happens when you capture those who are trying to kill you and they're not playing by the rules uh, was in back in 1942 in the United States. There were eight, I call them dry foot German saboteurs who were captured, some on Long Island, New York, and some in Florida. Six, uh, two of the eight uh, saboteurs flipped on the other six and okay. told the story. None of them were wearing uniforms, yet they had identification on them. They had the means uh, and material to cause great damage to infrastructure and kill. Mm -hmm. So uh, the president at the time uh, uh, decided to go to the Supreme Court and ask for permission to hold uh, uh, military commissions or military court. And it was decided by the Supreme Court also that these saboteurs were not entitled to habeas corpus. I see. So they were not entitled to due process because they didn't follow the rules of war. And the German saboteurs knew this. Just like a spy who goes into foreign territory knows that if they're captured, they could probably be killed. Mm -hmm. So the military commissions took place. Uh, the saboteurs had no rights, basically. Except under the commissions, the very basic rule of law is that the defendant would get the same rights as an American soldier would were he to be tried. Okay. So they were offered this. Uh, it, it's kind of minimal, and it's different than a federal court of law, which uh, war criminals now are afforded, right. uh, the Military Commissions Act of 2009. But within a matter of five or six weeks, they should, six of the eight German saboteurs were electrocuted. They were executed. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. They hadn't hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. They hadn't blown anything up. They caused no death or destruction. Yet because they didn't follow the, the rule of law, they were executed. I see. Yeah. So I think it's important that, that people understand that. So that was kind of some of our thinking, that we knew that the people we would be capturing and caring for mm -hmm. would have absolutely no rights. When the decision was made to go to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, my unit was sent there as uh, the Joint Detainee Operations Group. Right. So there were three basic groups. There was the battalion, which cared for the detainees directly. So uh, military police battalion, trained in detention operations. Then there was my unit, the 12-person unit, is sort of a on-hands command group. And then the higher element, or the joint task force uh, command group, was above us. Okay. So we would spend, most of my um, colleagues and I would spend time in the camps each day. Uh, we would file reports. We would do investigations. Mm -hmm. Uh, my job was to make sure that there was medical, preventive medical, and environmental services available to the camp. I see, yeah. So on occasion I would interview uh, some of the guards, uh, interview some of the detainees, uh, do camp inspections, and make sure that the complaints of the detainees were attended to. I understand, yeah. I would look at... Um, the military intelligence reports uh, and basically what we're talking about is a sergeant would go from uh, detention cell to detention cell okay yeah and talk to the detainee how are you doing how are you feeling yeah and he would write down what the detainee said so that would be shared with me and some other medical folks and we would go through it and we would keep very good records on who complained about what and when. And that's how we cared for them. When we first arrived, um, my boss, the camp commandant, yeah. uh, spoke directly with the Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld. And Don Rumsfeld said to my commander and to everyone else that even though we know that the detainees were not entitled to the protections of the Geneva Conventions, he said he expected us to treat them within the spirit of the conventions. Mm -hmm. 
And that really was a big relief because we were all wondering, well, how do we treat these guys? They don't have any rights. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. So but we made it clear. Th there is, a, like, you know, a, a, I would say a great uh, human side in, in all of this because, uh, like, you know, we, we hear many times uh, talking about Guantanamo, but, you know, in a way that, you know, is not actually the right way as, you know, things were down there. So uh, I, I think, you know, having the opportunity to hear, you know, from you mm -hmm. as, you know, a person who was actually, you know, there, you know, operating daily, like, you know, it's the best thing that can happen because, you know, we can hear directly from your experience. You Thank you so much. It, it means a lot to me personally to hear that because, again, I didn't join the army to kill people. I joined it to serve my country, learn a skill, earn a little extra money, pay off my college loans, and eventually to make it a second career. Yeah. And I think you find that 99.9% .9 of all the soldiers, airmen, uh, sailors, Marines, or Coast Guard that you might encounter are the same. We joined uh, to make a career because we have a love and a passion for what we do. And we all have different jobs, but each one of us takes it very seriously and wants to do the best we possibly can. And not just for our own personal gratitude, but we serve our country. We take an oath. Uh, we learn values. Uh, officers have to maintain the highest possible standards of character. Sure. and integrity and honesty and again there's there's exceptions to every rule but again 99 percent of the people i knew at guantanamo bay when i served were amazing people the hard work the dedication one of my heroes was a female um navy corpsman whose job was physical therapy yeah and each day i would visit uh, the detention medical facility which is basically uh, everyone knows the, the TV show MASH? Absolutely, uh, yes. <laughs> well, it stands for Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. Yeah. Well, the Navy have their own version. Okay. And it's called a fleet hospital, and it's in little pieces and tents. And they put that up on the beach, and or very close to the beach. And I would visit it daily. And this corpsman, this female corpsman, this physical therapist, would have to work with the detainees uh, because many of them came to us with war wounds. They came right from the battlefield. Yeah. So many had uh, X fixes, which is uh, an exterior fixation uh, construction to help set a bone. Uh, many of them had limps or missing limbs yeah. um, or were very sore. They had open wounds. And uh, this corpsman's job was to work with detainees who were not shackled. Mm -hmm. And to just give you a, uh, an idea of what or how intense it was working with the detainees, sure. we all knew that there was a prison uprising in Mazari Sharif, uh, Afghanistan, that killed the first American who died uh, in that war, mm -hmm. uh, Johnny Michael Spann, who was a CIA operative. He was interviewing uh, detainees in Mazari Sharif in a prison, a big prison. And there was an uprising where he was killed. Mm -hmm. And it became obvious that we could not physically uh, keep these detainees safe yeah. or secure mm -hmm. uh, in Afghanistan. So that's why they were brought over. But when Don Rumsfeld says in, in his book, uh, known and unknown, his autobiography, yeah. that these were the worst of the worst. Uh, he was correct. Uh, when I got there, uh, soon thereafter, we began getting many, many detainees. We had up to maybe 250 or more uh, from 20 different countries. Yeah. They spoke 20 or more different languages. Mm -hmm. These were soldiers of force, murderers and terrorists, definitely the worst of the worst. Most of them, not all of them. So they were put into a situation where they were not grouped together in tents like they are now, or even in cell blocks. They were basically, uh, for lack of a better term, dog kennels. Uh, okay. Camp X-Ray uh, was used basically from January 2002 to April 2002. Yeah. Just four months. Yeah, really Yet little time, yeah. 
whenever you see a story in the paper, or someone wants to talk about getting, or you see uh, the orange jumpsuits kneeling in gravel, mm -hmm. which was a holding area before they were in process. They might have been there maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes at tops. Okay. But that's everyone's view of what one yeah. time. Of, yeah. Uh, very misleading. Mm -hmm. But uh, the conditions in the beginning were very spartan. What they never showed you was that the American soldiers caring for them lived right up the hill in tents. So it wasn't until the detainees were moved to Camp Delta, a much better facility, that the American soldiers were allowed to move into better uh, conditions as well. Right. Yeah. But these guys had, had murder in their eyes. Um, they could look right through you. Mm -hmm. uh, you could tell that these were hardened soldiers and they were shackled whenever they were out of their cells, individual cells. It took two military police to move them. Their ankles were, were shackled, their wrists were shackled to a traveling belt around their waist. Mm -hmm. So they had very little mo mobility. Yeah. And because it was difficult to get around, because the ground was covered with gravel, um, two military policemen needed to escort the detainee so they wouldn't trip and fall. So uh, they were moved to showers, to exercise, to interrogation huts, and moved back by always two military police. So it was a very intense operation. I'm sure, yeah. In the detention hospital, they were shackled as well. They were shackled to their beds. Mm -hmm. They had very little mobility, and we were not allowed to carry with us ballpoint pens or necklaces, anything that a detainee could grab uh, to use as a weapon. Of course, yeah. But this female corpsman, physical therapist, worked with these detainees every day when they were unshackled. And I suppose it was also difficult for, for her as a woman because, you know, if we think about the mentality of many of these detainees, like, you know, having to deal with, the, you know, a, a woman is not so you know, in, into their mentality, so especially, you know, for, for medical things. So we have to think about this other side of the thing as well. That was one concern. Yeah. The other concern was that since these guys were the worst of the worst, they could have killed her with their bare hands at any time. Yeah. Now, there was a military policeman uh, who was with her, but he always was behind the detainee. So the detainee didn't really know what this police officer's posture was. Sure. But he knew that that person was there. And uh, one time I asked the military policeman, I said, well, why are you behind the detainee? Why aren't you between them? And he said, because when he tries to kill her, I will kill him. And he knows them. We've told him. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, needless to say, we didn't have any uh, disruptions there. Uh, yeah. But it wasn't all innocent. You know, there, It was very difficult, as you say, for the woman to be there, but uh, it was difficult for the military police because the mission of the medical is to heal. But we yeah. don't just heal the wound. We're trained to heal the whole person. Sure. You've heard of bedside manner mm -hmm. and small talk, and the military police did not like this at all. They thought that uh, the medical personnel were crossing the line into fraternization. Mm -hmm. So I spoke with the uh, Navy medical personnel, and I thought that it might be good for us to create an orientation uh, and debriefing. So, A, we could explain to the military police and to the Navy medical personnel what the mission was, uh, that it was complex and difficult for everyone, but that we needed to work together uh, to be successful and right. we had to appreciate the job of the other sure it's the job of the medical to heal the whole person but is to keep everyone safe exactly so you know the, the two things had to go together say yes I understand it but complicating even that was that the military police would rotate they would rotate in and out of the hospital from the detention facility or guard duty and that was frustrating mm -hmm. because just when you felt like you were getting a good team together, you had to start all over again. <laughs> exactly. Yes. But that, you know, uh, the Marines explained it the best. You know, the Marines have a saying 
uh, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. Yes. Or like Guantanamo, it was Semper Gumby, always flexible. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> Very good. <laughs> you just learn to go with the flow. Uh, but true. we also gave everyone opportunities after their shift ended to sit and talk about what had happened on their shift, how they felt about it. Of course, uh, because uh, there is a lot going on uh, psychologically, exactly. yes. Um, you know, policemen are, are asked not to be emotional and show emotions. Uh, so it was difficult for some of them to deal with the things that they saw and heard. Um, and even some, there was some abuse in the hospital. But when I say abuse, um, uh, even though I don't want to minimalize it, uh, it was minor. Um, there was one police officer who was seen uh, slapping the head of a detainee every time he fell asleep. Very inappropriate. And um, we took that extremely seriously. We told all the Navy medical personnel and, and Army police that there was absolutely, positively, no toleration for anything of that kind. So what we told them was, and this happened at the camp as well, um, every time a shift changed, each of the military police were given a briefing. Okay. And basically what that is, is reminding them what their job is, uh, what the rules were. They are not to talk to the detainees except to tell them what to do. Okay. It wasn't their job ever to have a conversation with them or to talk about personal issues. Mm -hmm. Either way, uh, not revealing anything personal about themselves was very important because a lot of the detainees, you may have heard, threaten the lives of the guards. Uh -huh. So of they course. began to wear tape over their names uh, or hide their rank. Uh, so that the detainees wouldn't have any information to throw back against the uh, guards. So this briefing, the same briefing, would take place every single time the guards would go on duty. Yeah. So, so we're trying to brainwash them uh, <laughs> into staying safe and secure. Yes. And that's what it was for. Um, the detainees were not helpful sometimes. They are trained, of course, and we had some of their training manuals. So we read... Uh, how they were trained to behave, mm -hmm. they to become captured. Uh, and they were trained to lie about their treatment. Okay. Uh, to claim that they've been abused or tortured. Uh, to ask for an attorney. Uh, to constantly ask when they were going to be released. Uh, basically to harass the guards. Uh, they threw urine and feces and other bodily fluids on the guards. They would do what we call a sucker punch. So each time a detainee had to be moved, the detainee was told to assume the position inside their cell, which is basically on their knees with their back toward the door and their hands behind their head. Once they were in that position, a guard would go in with the shackles and begin to shackle the detainee. Okay. However, some detainees uh, took sport in turning around and punching the uh, military police in the face just before the shackles were applied. It's called a sucker punch. And this happened not infrequently, oh, wow. uh, along with other abuse. I mean, some of these guys, they should just had to fight. Uh, the Australian, David Hicks, was one of these. Uh, in fact, he was known to say, although I didn't hear it myself, it was widely heard that he he wanted to kill an American before he left the island. Uh, he threatened guards. He uh, sucker punched them, uh, threw bodily fluids on them. and was not a, uh, a model citizen at all. Uh, but what, this was the behavior that they were taught and trained to have were they to be captured. Yeah. So they made it very difficult. Uh, I mentioned before that most of them were worst of the worst. Well, mm -hmm. there were several who really didn't belong. And how did we know this? Well, in the beginning, most of them were taken from the battlefield. Uh, and some, you know, would say, well, I'm a goat herder. I'm not a soldier. Yeah. Oh, I'm a teacher. I'm not a soldier, right? Yeah. So we all have other professions. Sure. But, um, there was one gentleman we nicknamed, we had nicknames for these guys, and part of it was, uh, you know, soldiers need to have a release. 
And we didn't mean it in a mean way. Like we wouldn't necessarily call uh, the detainee a nickname to their face or try to embarrass them with it. It was just a way for us uh, to try to put some levity or humor into our uh, very difficult jobs. So this one detainee, he was nicknamed Wild Bill. And he was nicknamed that because he, he exhibited very bizarre behavior. He would um, try to eat his uh, sandals, take physical bites out of them. He oh would my. hang. Yes, he would hang things from his genitals. He would um, uh, make strange noises. He would be very disruptive. Wow! And after a time, uh, we discovered that he had been a heroin addict uh, in Kandahar, and to support his habit, he picked up an AK-47 for the Taliban. Uh, but he had another complicating factor. He claimed to also be schizophrenic okay. and off of his medications. So the definition of schizophrenic is out of touch with reality. So this, along with going cold turkey off of heroin, explained the bizarre behavior. I see. So he was determined to no longer be of any intelligence value and no longer a threat to the United States. He was the first detainee repatriated. I actually drove the Humvee that took him to his Freedom Bird. Nice. Or, uh, in civilian language, I drove him to the plane that took him home. Yeah. Um, uh, before we put him on the plane, we had to stop for a couple of hours to hide from the media. Okay. Because we didn't want them to see this uh, exchange. Um, so we got a chance to talk to him through an interpreter, and this is how we learned his story. So... Needless to say, we kind of got attached to him, and it was kind of sad to see him go. Right. But we were happy that uh, we had uh, freed someone who really didn't belong there. I understand, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it made us feel good. Um, a couple of weeks later, though, um, since we did interact frequently with squirrels, um, alphabet soup, uh, there was a party my boss went to, and he came back from the party uh, with the secret squirrels and said, uh, you know that guy uh, we released a couple of weeks ago? Uh, I think his name was Abdul Razak. Uh, he said, yeah, as soon as he got off the plane, uh, they put a bullet in his head. Oh, and um, we were upset. We were very mm -hmm. upset. Sure, of course. Um, and we said, well, how do you know? And he said, well, the secret squirrels told me that. Oh, wow. So That's sad. Uh, uh, a few weeks after that, and we would scour the internet for stories about Guantanamo Bay to, because it was kind of funny because most of them were nowhere near the truth. And we found a story, it was on NBC.com, and I give the reference in my book. Uh, Abdul Razak was sitting on a hospital bed in Kandahar. Mm -hmm. He was very much alive. Mm -hmm. So the secret squirrels even lied to us. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, but... It was funny because in his interview, and again, this was one of the, the first repatriated de detainee from Gitmo. Yeah. In the interview, he talked about how well he was treated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that never made CNN. Yeah. Uh, but um, you know, but things like this. It, it's uh, amazing, human. like to see uh, how how the media, you know, if not being, you know. Uh, ha has we can say you know helpful in all of this you know actually you know trying to to make things more uh, confusional than, than you know they were so like I don't know like from me uh, uh, for me like uh, as a journalist th th this all sounds crazy because you know like media should be like very objective when telling things you know not trying to you know well, that's what we thought, and that's why it was very strange. Some of the journalists, I mean, most of the journalists that we encountered um, were from hometowns, there to interview soldiers from their hometown. Yeah. And we were briefed on how to behave and how to speak and say, yes, uh, we can talk about our jobs. We can talk about how we feel about our jobs, but we shouldn't talk about political questions or talk about things we're not directly involved in. Yeah. But there were some major media journalists there as well. Bob Franken was one of them. He worked CNN. Yeah. And uh, Bob was constantly trying to get information from us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would tell him, Bob, you know, we'd like to answer that question, but that information is classified. Sure. We're not allowed to give that out. Yeah. 
uh, but he would try and keep trying. Uh, and one time, I'll never forget, uh, I met him at the officers club, and he was there with, um, uh, I think, uh, a Navy chaplain and the Navy chaplain's daughter, and we were having uh, a couple of beers, and he says to me, he says, uh, Captain Granger, uh, what's your boss doing? Maybe you'd like to come down and join us. And I, my boss liked to have a beer or two every once in a while. So I called him up and he came down. Uh, it was in April and it was near the time when we were getting ready to transfer the detainees from Camp X-Ray to the new camp. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Franken wanted uh, desperately to know when that move was going to take place. And we wanted desperately not to tell him. Sure, of course. <laughs> He figured if he bought my, my boss beer after beer after beer, oh, he no. could uh, But even though my boss was a wiry guy, not very big guy, uh, he could drink anybody under the table. And, there didn't. You go. and finally, in frustration, Bob Franken, again, a very you know, respected CNN correspondent, told us, and this is in the book as well, if you don't tell me what I want to know, I'll just make it up. And that was kind of a wake-up call because mm -hmm. he did. We would not tell him when the move was going to be, and then uh, not not long after that, there was information on CNN saying mm -hmm. the move was going to be. Yeah. So as soon as we saw that, we knew not to let them. Let no, but the you know, it's also a question of safety. Like you know, you, you cannot say things like this. Because you know it is about you know safety. We were actually saying that you know usually like uh, on the mainstream media uh, we don't hear you know talking uh, about uh, Guantanamo like you know in a, a positive way if we can say that. Uh, but uh, can you know just to tell maybe a story like can you tell me what what was maybe the most significant moment that you have experienced while being there? Hmm. That's a difficult question. I think it's a it's a combination of the things I've told you about, you know, just being very proud of the physical therapist and how she went about her job so professionally, being proud of, of the military police, uh, working in a very hot environment uh, that's very physically demanding, 12-hour uh, days, uh, seven-day work weeks. Uh, nobody had days off for months. Um, being able to do something we perceived as good uh, with repatriating Abdul Razak. Um, just being proud of, of what we were doing. And my perspective of it, since I was a teenager studying uh, Americans in, in prisoner of war camps, and being proud of, of uh, how we treat prisoners of war. And liking the fact that we were told to treat these detainees within the spirit of the Geneva Conventions, which was a big relief for us because we didn't know how else to treat them. And we were trained to do things one way, and that's the right way. So it was a relief to do that. So I think uh, rather than just one moment or, or one incident, um, just putting these things together and uh, struggling, in fact, when I came home with trying to explain to people, no, 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 it's not the way you see it on TV. Really. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're the good guys, remember? Uh, you know, we're not the ones that, that flew planes into buildings and killed innocent people. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think um, that's something that many people forget. The purpose of Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, the reason why these men were not shot and killed on the battlefield, which they could have legally been shot and killed on the battlefield, was to get valuable information from them that saved exactly. many lives. Yeah. Um, and that was confirmed when I read uh, former President George W. Bush's autobiography, uh, um, Decision Points. Mm -hmm. And both he and Don Rumsfeld have uh, very good sections in their books about Guantanamo, about why it's there, uh, the purpose for it. And in fact, 
that they did get some valuable information, they say, saved many lives. And I believe that with all my heart. The complexities that we see now, though, with um, releasing detainees, especially some of those worst of the worst detainees, uh, is that they are returning to the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you read about, well, it's around 30% recidivism. Mm -hmm. well, wait a minute. That's only the ones we know about or suspect have returned. What about the 70% we don't know about? Where are those guys? What are they doing? Are they in our neighborhoods? You know, what's going on with them? And that's a question that you never hear asked. But it's one that, that everyone should be asking. You know, everyone, I think, should ask themselves the question, do you feel safer with detain detainees in or out of Gitmo? And I think if your answer is, well, I feel safer with them in, of course, mm -hmm then that is sort of what we should do. Because uh, let's say we are playing by the rules and these, these were prisoners of war. Let's pretend for a moment that they are lawful combatants. We would be entitled to hold them without charge until the end of hostilities. And in fact, we held over 400,000 prisoners of war in the United States during World War II, yeah. and not one of them was offered extra legal privileges. They were simply being held until the end of hostilities. And when end of hostilities took place, they were repatriated. We did the same thing after the first Gulf War. Yeah. We captured thousands of Iraqi soldiers, but they were wearing uniforms. They carried their arms open. The war lasted 10 days, and then several days after that, they all went home, unharmed. And that's what America is all about. That is the spirit that we carry with us every day at Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, and we fight and we struggle mentally and emotionally with the constant barrage from the mainstream media saying that what we're doing there is wrong, that it's a gulag that we torture, we abuse. Um, for the record, the United States military is not trained in any torture or abuse technique ever. Uh, waterboarding, which was an approved enhanced interrogation technique, which was used on a handful of detainees at Gitmo, uh, is a very, very technical and skilled technique. It did never fit the definition, the internationally uh, accepted definition of torture, which I also put in my book. So. Yeah. Readers can compare, um, you know, what this is, what is waterboarding, with the actual definition of torture. Right. It does not rise to that level. Um, and in fact, uh, only the CIA has been trained in this technique. So I'm not making excuses for them. I'm not saying uh, it's a good thing or a bad thing. What I am saying is that the military personnel are not trained in these techniques. Okay. So when, if you look at uh, what happened at Abu Ghraib uh, prison uh, during the scandal, all of that which we saw the pictures of uh, was very embarrassing mm -hmm. and to this day is very upsetting to those of us yeah. uh, who did the right thing. 100% mm -hmm. um, wrong, it was 100% abusive, uh, but was not endemic those soldiers were not trained how to do that. And the upsetting thing to me is that you hear very, very little about those who told those soldiers what to do. Those soldiers didn't make that up. They didn't just wake up one day and said, hey, let's do this to the detainees. Mm -hmm. They were instructed what to do. They were told what to do by someone else. Still 100% wrong, embarrassing, um, and frustrating. But... Where are the people that told them to do it? Uh, as far as I can tell through research, only about four intelligence uh, personnel were ever prosecuted uh, for doing that. But my feeling is it must have come from high up uh, uh, and then swept under the rug, whoever was responsible for it. But the only abuse that ever took place that was institutional was detainees against the guards. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and still to this day, the guards are abused by detainees, uh, having bodily food. Yeah. So it's it's very difficult. I understand. Uh, one one thing that um, I, I would like to um, ask you is that uh, I heard that uh, you know that there were uh, talks about um, making your book uh, Saving Grace at Guantanamo Bay also into a movie. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I think that will be actually a very, very uh, interesting thing to do because you know it, it's such a, a true and powerful story that I think you know would make a great movie. So, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, w what can you tell me about it? Like, have you like heard uh, any offers like this? Or, you know, talks or you know whatever. Well, offers, yeah, but that's an interesting question. I'm flattered, really. Um, maybe you could be my agent. Um, <laughs> Why not? I would love to. <laughs> a few years ago, there was this pop-up website uh, called WikiLeaks Movie. And uh, it seemed legitimate at the time, and I think it's still out there. But um, they did a very extensive interview. It was a written interview, and they published it all. And they asked me if there was a movie made about my uh, my book, what would it be like? Yeah. So I even went so far as to pick people to play certain roles, uh, oh, to kind of fantasize about the movie, how it would, it would have to be funny. I think uh, Oscar Wilde said one time, make people laugh or they'll kill you. Uh, so something along the lines of MASH, uh, maybe not so irreverent, maybe more in the lines of a Walter Mitty, mm -hmm. uh, because to, to really survive this, I think emotionally and mentally, you have to uh, let your sense of humor uh, work into, into, the, into your daily practices. Sure. So uh, one of the things we did to try to uh, you know, make things a little more uplifting like I told you before, we give nicknames, but we call the detainees carrots. So I think that would play very well in the movie because we never referred to them really as detainees. Okay. We called them carrots. And the reason why is we gave them orange jumpsuits and they were sure. all very thin when they came. Yeah. Yeah. And we called Camp X-Ray, not Camp X-Ray, but more, more often than not, we called it the garden. So think of that mindset. We go to the garden to take care of the carrots. <laughs> And it just helped us, you know, sure, it helped us uh, deal with uh, the struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it emotional train wreck. Yeah. You know, the uh, empathy, yet the hatred. And I never hide in my book the hatred that I had for people I, I never knew before I went to get mine. But I hated these men, and I hated them because they took me away from my wife and children. Uh, my third son, whom I left two days after his birth. Uh, I'm grateful I was there for his birth, but the guilt that I had while I was at Gitmo not being a complete father or a good husband and not being there for my fa family was very torturous. Of course, and, so, and, and no one gives you back that time as well. Like, you know, like, like you, you actually gave your time for, for your country while actually your, your family, you know, needed you to be there. So like, you know, your, your time in, in that case is even more uh, meaningful, you know, because, you know, you were doing a, a big sacrifice personally. It's very kind of you. Yeah, that's Thank the you truth. so much. Um, but back then we didn't think of it that way. We just, we, you know, we would laugh at each other sometimes because some of us would get really sad or upset and then the others of us would, you know, uh, make fun of the person and say, oh, have a pity party. You know, come on, you're getting paid. <laughs> you know, <laughs> can't be that bad. Yeah. You're, you're, in the, you're in the Caribbean. <laughs> you know? There you go, yes. Uh, well, th that's not really like, uh, how do you say, the, the holiday place to be. In Guantanamo, <laughs> there you go. Well, the nickname you know is Club Gitmo. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> and really, if you didn't have to deal directly with detainees, it's probably one of the best places to get stationed because there's scuba diving, there's water sports, uh, fishing. Definitely a beautiful uh, place. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of recreational opportunities. There's restaurants. Um, 
they really tried to make it as much uh, about home as possible. They had double feature movies every night at an outdoor movie theater. Um, they really made big efforts. The civilians there, uh, I'll never forget, and I write about this in the book, they had a talent show at the local high school, local school. And they invited us. And my good friend, um, the JAG officer or attorney that went to get my with us was asked to be the master of ceremonies. Okay. And he really is a funny guy, but it was so sweet, Tisha. The kids uh, did acts. They made us laugh. They made us cry. Uh, it was just a, like a little slice of home. Uh, and we're really uh, appreciative of the civilians who were there who understood that we were away from our families uh, and tried to make it a little bit better for us. That, that was a great comfort for you. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, talking about the movie, there are these little vignettes, these little things that happen that people would never imagine would happen, um, you know, that took place that I think if you could express it in the medium of film, uh, it could have great impact. Absolutely. And if nothing else, just show a little of what it's like to be a soldier or a sailor, a Marine, and it was a joint mission. So uh, we had Air Force uh, doctors there. I mean, it was really a joint mission, and everybody had a special, unique talent that they brought to the place. Um, and uh, I, I think it's important for people to know that um, we did do our best, that they could be proud of uh, everyone who's there, just about everyone who is there they can be proud of. But uh, I think the movie would have to be a comedy drama because the material is so heavy at times mm -hmm. uh, that unless you have some really good humor in there, uh, I, I think people will get up and leave <laughs> because it's so depressing. Um, I think well, I, a bit, uh, say, you know, the, the kind of atmosphere that you, you might have, say, in full metal jacket, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, that, of course, it's a, it's a heavy movie, but, you know, there are also moments of, say, uh, humor, no? So, uh, yes. having this kind of balance, maybe, something like this. Yes, I think it would be fun to make yeah. and uh, fun to watch. But, uh, thanks for bringing that up. It's very kind of you. Um, well, I, I, you know, I, I actually support this uh, very strongly. So, like, if any director out out there like wants to make it as a movie, give us a shout. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Uh, I reached out to Tom Hanks a few times. Yeah. Uh, he's done some military movies. Yep. And Clint Eastwood. Mm -hmm. Definitely. He's yeah. he's actually got a very good sense of humor. Um, yeah. You know, guys like that, Spielberg, you know, if they wanted to change a pace. Um, but you never know what could happen. Uh, but I'm working on this, the sequel, and the sequel is, I pretty much did the same thing I did at Gitmo uh, in Iraq. Okay. I, I did spend time at Abu Ghraib prison after the scandal. Uh, my unit was sent in to... Uh, quote unquote, help clean it up. Um, but when I got there and saw the conditions under which the detainees were kept, it was very depressing. Um, and these conditions, I was told, were better than what they had before we got there. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to give you an example, uh, the drainage is very poor in Iraq. The soil is very clay like and doesn't drain well. So the water sits on top and creates very sticky mud. Uh, so when I got there in the winter of 2004-2005, uh, actually um, January 2005, uh, it was just a horrible mess. Uh, the detainees lived in tents. Uh, during the scandal, they had been held in what we call the hard site or um, structured prison. Yeah. Uh, but afterwards, uh, they wanted things to be more transparent, so we put them in uh, tents a uh, place called Camp Redemption. Inside uh, this old fort uh, in Abu Ghraib. And they were allowed a shower once a week. 
but the shower was simply a spigot three feet off the ground in plain sight. Mm -hmm. So the detainee had to squat. Uh, they were given a short amount of time. The water was not heated. Um, to me, that, that was um, a defeat. Uh, it was unacceptable to me. Um, the latrines or porta johns that you might see uh, at a construction site or what they had to use the restroom. But if you know about Middle Eastern culture, they don't sit like we do. Uh, they squat. Yeah. But, but um, these porta johns were the Western style. And I learned that we could have gotten the Middle Eastern style toilets for them, but didn't. Uh, the culture is different. Um, they ignored pretty much the hand washing stations we put outside and they ignored the toilet tissue. So there was a, a big sanitary concern. Uh, another issue culturally that we discovered there was that they didn't like taking their medicine. They would complain about ailments, they'd be diagnosed. Okay. And of course, Western medicine says we're going to give you a pill for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had the medicine and wouldn't take it. They'd complain about the same ailment. It was difficult to explain to them, well, if you take the medicine, the ailment will go away. Uh, but they didn't see it that way. Uh, many of them just refused to take the medication, which was a huge waste and expense on our part. But we didn't know what else to do. Uh, I worked for a time in logistics for the military police brigade that was in control of the prison and discovered that the uh, third-party contractor we had uh, contracted for detention meals uh, came to about $14 per day per detainee. Now, $14 per day in Iraq back in 2005 was a fair amount of money. Yeah. Um, but I discovered that they were only spending $7 per detainee on the meal, not 14 mm -hmm. And I discovered that because I went and inspected the meals, and it was, it was pathetic. It, oh, it, wow. It was not enough food. It was not enough calories, um, and the quality was poor. So the detainees would would uh, complain to us about that. Mm -hmm. um, I met a gentleman in the camp one day. He, he was incarcerated. He claimed to be one of Saddam's generals. I believed him because of his stature and his behavior, his English skills. And he said, uh, Captain, you have an opportunity here. And I said, what do you mean? He said, uh, you have an opportunity to show these people. And uh, he was talking about the other uh, detainees who Americans really are. And I was uh, profoundly embarrassed because he gestured to the camp and he said, this is not who Americans are. Mm -hmm. And I agreed with him. Um, I filed my daily reports. And not long after certain reports, uh, I found myself reassigned. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so they got me out of there pretty quick because I, I was just, I was adamant that this was... Um, uh, not the right way to do things. Mm -hmm. So I got sent to a place called Ashraf. Ashraf is in uh, east central Iraq and it is a town that at the time uh, was controlled uh, by the United States uh, but we had a small detention facility inside the town of Ashraf. Ashraf was the last um, town it was occupied by the Mujahideen al Kak or Mech, yeah. uh, also known as the uh, People's uh, Mujahideen Organization of yeah. Iran. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, um, Iranian expatriate nationalists who wanted to overthrow the mullahs of Iran uh, acted as Saddam Hussein's henchmen. Uh, before we invaded uh, in 2003. And there were about 3,000 of them. They were formerly um, armored battalions who fought with Saddam Hussein, uh, you know, on his side. Uh, they put down the Kurdish rebellion, we found out by talking to an interpreter we met there, not by firing one shot on the Kurds. And we said to the interpreter, what do you mean? 
he said many Kurds lost their lives in the rebellion. He said, we lined them up in the streets and ran them over with our tanks. And that gave us some insight into who, who the mech were. Uh, controlled by women. No marriages. No children. So how do you keep an organization going if there are no marriages and no children? Well, you recruit. So they have recruiters in Europe and other parts of the country of the world, where they uh, seek out Iranian uh, nationalists and tell them that they must come to Iraq uh, and join Ashraf University. There was no university in Ashraf. So what would happen is these recruits would become disillusioned and they would defect. So it kind of reminded me of Hogan's Heroes, if you remember that uh, 1960s show where uh, the German guards were sort of ambivalent and the Americans probably could have escaped any time they wanted. Mm -hmm. Within this uh, perimeter, this 3,000 person city or town, uh, there was a long road leading from the town to where we were, the Americans. And if you didn't want to be part of the mech anymore, you could walk down that long road and give yourself up. You would be interviewed and then placed in the detention facility, which again was more like a POW camp. Okay. Uh, because these individuals were not accused of any war crimes. Uh, they were allowed to purchase things off the internet. Uh, they had created, with just tent material and wood, a fabulous uh, little suburb, if you will. They made plants out of uh, sandbag material. And from a distance, you'd swear that you were looking at a palm tree, or tall grasses, or a bush. But they were all made by uh, these detainees who were I waiting see. to be repatriated. They made fountains, they made gardens out of stones and anything they could get their hands on. Mm -hmm. They made porches, they were given tents, but they made porches for the tents and furniture. And if you walked inside, you'd never know you were in a tent. It was fabulous, Amazing. the skills. Um, but they made it for themselves, waiting to get repatriated. Some were repatriated to Iran, uh, not good for them. Mm. Uh, very few were repatriated to third countries where they claim to have dual citizenship. I see. But um, the interesting fact about Ashraf was there was no incoming. And by that I mean there were no bullets or, or missiles. Okay. Or mm -hmm. It was the only forward operating base in Iraq at the time that did not have any incoming. And it, I was very curious about this. And over time I learned that because uh, during the time of Saddam Hussein, the mech were so feared, even though we had taken all their weapons away, the local insurgents and folks who were trying to kill us were more afraid of the mech than they were of us. I see, yeah. Uh, they would kill us on the roads, but they would never try to penetrate. They would never try to come into Ashraf. Uh, and do anything bad to us, which was very strange. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was an interesting... Maybe, maybe they didn't have, say, the, uh, the, the right kind of uh, force or equipment, like, you know, to, to try and do that, because that might be... Yeah, there was, there was um, a very interesting relationship. The mech, while I was there, had a mosque built. And the mech are not really Muslims. Uh, they, they're sort of their own sect. Um, but they built a mosque for the local people to come in. They had built a martyr museum. In other words, all the people that um, were related to them who were killed by the mullahs in Iran. Uh, and they showed us the museum. We had tours of the museum, the personal effects, um, movies of beheadings and hangings. Uh. Uh, trying to convince us that they were, you know, should be taken off the uh, uh, list of terrorist organizations, as it were. The irony is that the leaders of that group were part of the Iranians who took the Americans hostage. 
um, back in the late 70s. So our relationship with them was quite odd. Uh, because they were all wearing uniforms and belonged to an organization and a structure, when we went in in April of 2003, they surrendered. So we really didn't know what to do with them. So they became technically protected persons. Um, after I left, I learned maybe a couple of years ago, after the United States left, that um, the Iraqi uh, folks went in there and uh, captured them all and took Ashraf. And I really don't know what happened after that. That was it was a fascinating time then. Yeah, so we were saying um, about uh, the possibility of your book becoming a movie. But yeah. uh, one thing that uh, I know is that uh, you have been uh, also interviewed uh, already in a documentary that is called Memories of Guantanamo. Uh, yes. Would you like to tell me uh, something about it? Oh, what a wonderful movie. I haven't actually seen it. Um, I've seen uh, outtakes of it. And I'm hoping that it can get uh, a wide distribution because it is a terrific uh, piece of art and a terrific piece of history. Uh, Trevor Ward, the uh, producer, director, writer, filmmaker, uh, he's an award-winning documentarian, a uh, terrific human being. Uh, he has ties to Guantanamo. And uh, without spoiling it, um, he goes back to Guantanamo and talks to people who grew up there. He talks to some of the uh, expatriate uh, Cubanos yeah. uh, who were allowed to live at Guantanamo and claim uh, asylum there. Uh, most of these folks are quite old now and many have died, died and passed on. Um, but he tells a unique story. You know, we've got a long history with it. So as far back as he could find people, he interviews them and they tell their own unique stories about why they were there, what they did there, uh, where they came from. And it's just a wonderful thing. I wish somebody had made this movie before I went there. There you go. Yeah. Uh, because uh, back then the tours were only six months long and usually a Navy tour is shorter than that. And you don't really appreciate it. You don't really understand it until just before you leave and you think to yourself, wow, what a cool place this is. And the interesting people. While I was there, I got a very tiny glimpse of some of this coolness because I immediately befriended the Army veterinarian. Yeah. Now, most people don't know that the only service branch that has veterinarians is the Army. And there's a veterinarian post on every Air Force base and naval base. And so this army outpost, this lone veterinarian, uh, was in charge of all the animals. So I got to learn about the feral cats, about the boa constrictors, and of course the rock stars of Gitmo, the Cuban black rock iguana. There you go. And, uh, to give you an idea of picture India where they let the cows and the monkeys roam free wherever they want to go, it's kind of the same with the iguanas. Um, but I would ride with her sometimes to go take care of some of the unique animals. She said, I know it's a Navy base, but there's only one goat, and the location we cannot disclose because goats on a Navy base <laughs> <laughs> always become mascots. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I got to feed some uh, feral kittens. Uh, in fact, at one point I got to give the orientation uh, to um, new military folks coming on. There you go. Part, of my, part yeah. of my orientation was about the animals uh, at Kipling. Um But Trevor uh, Ward has put together such a fabulous, it's, it's, it's done with humor. Uh, there's some humor in it, there's some profound sadness in it, uh, but I, I think he just did a wonderful job with it. The outtakes that I've seen are just marvelous, and I was so proud um, to have uh, been asked to be part of it. I guess Trevor heard about my book or something, and he actually came to my home. There you go, yeah. With his crew, and yeah. they interviewed me in my backyard at sunset. 
in October <laughs> or early November. It was really a unique experience, and I hope um, you know. I, from time to time, I tweet the link out there, so I hope people get curious about uh, this um, documentary and seek it out. And hopefully, we can get into some movie theaters. Yeah, that would be great. Of course, we met on on Twitter like many years ago now, and uh, you have a great community there of followers. And uh, um, you have a profile also, you know, on other social networks. So mm -hmm. what do you enjoy most about social media and the interaction you have with people? People like you. I mean, people who are sincere. Real people. Um, and it's kind of like walking down Main Street. That's what I, I, I like to compare Twitter yeah. to. You're walking down Main Street. Um, and you just wave to people, you say hello, maybe you chat. Uh, and for me, it, it's very relaxing. Um, and it's fun. You know, you never know what you're going to come across. Uh, and I think the really exciting thing is that if you get a thought, you can share it with a lot of people. Yeah. And you get reactions from it. And that kind of feeds the ego a little bit. Um, but also you're sharing things with people who also like to share. So, um, again, meeting people like you, very sincere people uh, who have interesting lives and interesting um, uh, things they like to do. And, uh, it's a lot of fun. Absolutely. And so we want to uh, remind uh, our followers how to follow you on Twitter. So your username is mjgranger1. One, yes. Okay. And uh, uh, so, um, also, like, uh, would you like to um, say, like, you know, uh, in which other ways possible, like, you know, to contact you or to find about your book? Yes. Um, my book is Saving Grace at Guantanamo Bay, a memoir of a citizen warrior. And it can be found on Amazon. I think that's the easiest place to find it. Um, it's it's funny because some people say they're going to get it right away or they have to save up for it. Don't save up. Ask your public library yeah. to get a copy. And you can be the first to check it out. Um, but I'm very grateful for all my followers, all my fans. I'm grateful to you. Uh, such a great longtime friend. And uh, I think one of the most, the things I enjoy really most is helping other people on Twitter and just retweeting things that are really cool and uh, because so many people like yourself do that for me and I think I read it in a, um, a self-help book by Zig Ziglar an inspirational speaker who passed away a few years ago he said you can get anything you want in life as long as you help enough other people get what they want that's true yeah. and I think it's a great way to go about things but they can find the book on Amazon. Uh, it's also available at Barnes and Noble. And I'm very grateful to anyone who would like to take a look at it. Very good. So Montgomery, I just say that you know it's absolutely an honor to have you here today, and you know I, I'm just really happy that you know we got the chance to do this interview together. And, uh, you know, you're welcome back here on the show anytime. You're marvelous. You really are a good friend. Thank and I'm you. so grateful that I made it to the big time. <laughs> <laughs> I've so, always wanted to be interviewed by you. So finally my dream comes true. There you go. <laughs> That's beautiful. And, uh, you know, likewise, I have to say, because we've been saying this for a long time and finally it's happening. <laughs> Uh, and that's because of you. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much again. And uh, uh, of course, you know, we're going to uh, talk as usual on Twitter very soon. Thank you yes. so much. Tweet for you later. <laughs>